I want to start off with uh, talking about the question that's probably caused more barroom fights and probably broken up more marriages than anything else in recent marriage and in recent history. And in fact, that that's this question right here. <laughs> so the dress you're looking at, of course, this was making its way on Instagram earlier this year. The question is, is this dress uh, white and gold or is it blue and black? The correct answer, how many say it's white and gold? Right. Yes. Yeah. How many say it's black and, uh, black and blue? Right. The correct answer is, is that the dress is black and blue. Uh, what you're actually looking at here is an effect of white contrast in the picture, and you're actually seeing the white balance effect come out, such that this looks like it's uh, black and uh, sorry, uh, white and black to sorry, white and gold to most of us here. I, I've seen it every way. I'm all encompassing. Uh, it looks uh, that way to some people, and of course, the real answer is that it's black, blue, and black. What's interesting are some of the explanations going around for this on the internet. Uh, there were some of those explanations like that. Others sound more or less authoritative when they describe it. But one of my favorite ones was actually a very incorrect explanation of this, which is that some people actually have a fourth type of cone. How many have heard this? A fourth type of cone, some of the color sensing eyes in our cells, and sorry, color sensing cells in our eyes that enable us to see this a little bit better. So people who have this fourth type of cone are able to differentiate these colors better. They're not subject to the same background effect that the rest of us who see this as white and gold actually do. And of course, this is wrong. We don't have four cones. There's maybe a little bit of evidence that some people have a slightly different red-green color sensitivity, but there's really no good evidence that there are four types of cones. What I really think this points out is that we like simple, biological-sounding explanations for what are really complex things. Here's some more examples of this. I'm going to show you some news headlines. And if you're not laughing along with these headlines when I'm showing you, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to appreciate this by the end, why these are actually funny. Uh, this is the language gene that's more active in young girls than in young boys. Right? Uh, scientists find the gene that may be responsible for anxiety. So again, I'm laughing at all these pretty good already. We'll get some good ones if you're not yet. Uh, have scientists found the autism gene in big bold capital letters there? Breakthrough a specific link between DNA and the condition is discovered. It's not really. It's a misleading headline. We'll get to there in a second. A gene mutation for excessive alcohol drinking found. This one's better. This one's better because they actually do have a gene mutation. They're talking about this is what I'll call a complex trait. I'm not saying there's a single gene disorder. Uh, feeling panicked, it could be in the genes. And of course, this is the one about a serotonin transporter polymorphism. And if those aren't funny, here's one that should get you going. Sorry, the head's in the way there. Uh, that says, uh, people without gene for underarm odor still wear deodorant. <laughs> All right, so here's why I think these things are funny is that most traits, in fact, I'll talk about some traits that will never use the word cause. I'll give you some examples here of traits that are, in fact, caused by genes. What this means is that if you look at a pedigree, something like this, this is what we call a Mendelian pattern of inheritance, named after Gregor Mendel. Uh, these are traits for which, if you have the gene for this trait, you will develop the trait. I'm actually depicting a dominant pattern of inheritance here. Of course, there's sex linked traits, there's recessive traits, and others. Uh, that doesn't matter as much for this, because the idea is, is that each of these black circles, uh, each of these black circles would correspond to someone who has inherited the gene for this trait, whatever the trait is. I'll give you some examples in just a second. Uh, these people have inherited the gene for it, such that dad here who has passed it on to one of his kids. Uh, this daughter, in this case, has passed it on to two of her kids, whatever the trait is. Uh, whereas this one over here doesn't carry the gene, doesn't express the trait. None of this person's kids will ever have the trait. These are, again, genetic disorders. There are wonderful examples of this in human uh, genetics. Uh, one of the ones I always like to talk about is your fingers. Uh, if you imagine your first knuckle to your second, if you have hair between your first knuckle and your second knuckle, that's a dominant trait. You inherited that from your parents. One of your two parents also has that. They have a gene that turns on during development that makes hair grow there. Another one is free earlobes. If you have free earlobes, that's another genetically linked trait. Another one is a widow's peak, which you can't see on me because I have yet another trait, which is male pattern baldness. Uh, so you can't see my widow's peak completely there. Uh, all of these, again, are not dominant patterns of inheritance, which I'm showing here. But the idea is, again, if you have the gene for this trait, you will have the trait, and your kids could have that trait. There are examples of this like this in human genetics, too, other than just these trivial examples. You can think about things like the, uh, PKU, this inborn error of metabolism. Uh, we can, in fact, treat this pretty well now by putting kids on phenylalanine-free diets. Uh, there's other diseases that affect the adults in the case of Huntington's disease. Uh, in fact, this could be a pedigree for what we call a Huntington pedigree. Uh, if this person here has Huntington's disease, that means they have the disease-causing allele of the Huntington gene. They will develop Huntington's disease. There's no treatment we currently have to be able to stop that. You will be able to develop that disease. Uh, sorry, you will develop that disease. These people who don't have the gene, they will never pass on this gene, disease because they don't have the gene for that disease. Right? 
So again, some genes are caused by a single trait. Another example of this would be what I'll call familial forms of traits, uh, familial forms of diseases, in this case, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what you're looking at here is a picture on the right of a normal healthy brain. You can see the nice uh, structures there. Looks good and healthy. The one on the right is a brain from a person with advanced Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you can see by the structure of this brain, there's a lot of neuronal loss. Uh, this brain is not going to be from a healthy person. This person is, for lack of an easier way to say this, on their way to death. And it's going to be ca caused by the Alzheimer's disease that's killing them. If you would look at the microstructure of this brain here, you're going to see the classic hallmarks of it, the neurofibrillary tangles, the amyloid plaques, uh, these types of things that underlie the neuronal death. And of course, there's different types of Alzheimer's disease. One of these types is in fact what we'll call familial Alzheimer's disease. This is going to be the type of Alzheimer's that's very early onset, very severe, caused by one of a couple of different gene mutations. An APP called amyloid precursor protein, another gene called presenilin. There's presenilin 1 and 2. If you inherit the disease-causing allele of those genes from your parents, you will develop Alzheimer's disease. It will be early and it will be severe. But of course, these are rare mutations. These are incredibly rare mutations. They account for best a couple of percent of all cases of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, most of the cases of Alzheimer's disease are in fact what we call sporadic. Uh, these are types of Alzheimer's disease that are not caused by dominant mutations like the kinds of APP and presenilin mutations I mentioned. Uh, these are the types of Alzheimer's that will have a variable age of onset. They have a variable rate of progression through the recognized stages of Alzheimer's disease. You're still going to die of the disease, uh, but it's going to be an unknown when, when and where you're going to contract it. If you have a family history of this type of Alzheimer's disease, you will develop the disease. If you have a family history of this type of disease, you might develop the disease. In fact, you're going to be at increased risk for the disease uh, for some reasons I'll get into in just a second. Uh, largely the reason we know these types of things come from studies of twins. In fact, these are what psychiatric geneticists like to call nature's experiments. Uh, these are pictures of two identical twins you can see right there. These twins developed from the same egg early during development. It's split into two. We have two individuals that were derived from the same egg. These two girls share 100% of their genes. And of course, we have another experiment of nature, which is going to be called fraternal twins. These are twins that develop from separate eggs. They're going to be no more closely related than with brother and brother, or sister and sister, or brother and sister. They, on average, share about 50% of their genes. And so if you would compare large <coughs> sets of identical twins to large sets of fraternal twins for different traits, you're going to be able to see that almost every trait you can think of, including all these disorders I've listed over here, Alzheimer's disease, anxiety disorder, all the way down to substance use disorders, and all the other letters of the alphabet you can start diseases with, will be influenced by genes. I'll get into why this is in just a second, but of course these traits come from our brains, and that's sort of the tagline to everything that I'm about to describe. To describe. All right. This is the basic problem that I see, and this is where I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk getting into, is we have this very dichotomous view of, of states. So in this case, I'm going to talk about this generally as any type of disorder. It could be a mental disorder. It could be some other type of disorder, such as infections. And in fact, uh, if you think about infections, uh, it's very easy to see that if you have an infection, for instance, you're going to be sick. If you have a broken bone, you're going to be sick. The problem is, is that most of those disorders I just showed you on the previous slide, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, anxiety disorders, depression, uh, depression related disorders, they don't really exist in these two types of states. In fact, there's this big blur between the two of them where we have sick over one and healthy of the other, but people who fall all along the range of their in-between. If you want to visualize this a little bit differently, you can imagine this as this bell-shaped curve. In fact, most traits that we can measure in nature are simply not bimodal. They're either normally distributed, they might be skewed, but in any case there's not one of two states. And what this means is that it's very unlikely that for most of these traits that follow a distribution like this, uh, it's very unlikely there's going to be a single gene that underlies those two traits, or else you would have just two states that are possible. And so if you think about putting, for instance, on this x-axis down here something like body weight, uh, the average person is going to have the average body weight as defined by that population. Uh, you're going to have people over at this end that are going to be obese, people over at this end that are going to be very, very lightweight, uh, but of course, what we're going to draw here is some arbitrary line when we set up our disease categories. If you're talking about risk factors for obesity, you're talking about what makes these people over here different from the people over there. If you want to blow this up a little bit, of course, uh, we can imagine that everyone to the left of this line we could call normal. Everyone to the right of this line we could call abnormal. And of course, when you think about this from a quantitative state as opposed to a dichotomous state, 
you can clearly see that there's really probably no fundamental difference between a person who falls right there and a person who falls right there. They're differing in, they're differing in uh, uh, normal ranges of normal traits. Again, most traits just simply aren't bimodal. Uh, here's the quote from Kemmerkenberg. <laughs> He's one of the foremost psychiatric geneticists. I like this quote quite a lot because this sets up nicely where I want to finish. Uh, he has this quote for this is actually from a rebuttal letter to a, uh, a psychiatrist who was doubting much of what he was actually doing. Uh, he says, behavior is instantiated by <coughs> brains, which are the product of evolution. The evidence that genetic factors influence behavior in all other animals is overwhelming. Is it really plausible that humans would be the only species whose behavior is unrelated to our genetic makeup? I think this is entirely true, because again, our brains are the product of our genes, but they're also the product of our environment. The way that we perceive the world, the way that we interact with the world, the way that we develop disorders for that matter, is going to come from our genes, which are a biological entity. And so you can imagine a couple of different situations here. And so what we're going to do now is get meta, and by that I mean metaphysically deterministic. <laughs> Worked on that one a very long time. <laughs> All right. We've got this one possibility right here. We could imagine, for instance, that genes cause thoughts and behavior. I gave an example earlier of familial types of Alzheimer's disease. This is certainly the case where if, again, you inherit that disease-causing form of APP or presenilin, you will develop Alzheimer's disease. Same as Huntington's, uh, Huntington's disease. If you inherit the disease-causing version of the Huntington allele, of the Huntington gene, uh, you will develop Huntington's disease. But again, these are the exceptions. Most of the traits that we can measure in people, that we can measure in other animals for that matter too, don't follow into these little nice discrete categories. There's no yes versus no, there's blendings all the way through. So at the other side of this, we have a very environmental model here. So here's the notion that your environment, so all of the things that are coming into you, your memories, your thoughts, Everything about you is going to determine your behavior. This is what the psychologist would like to call the tabula rasa or the blank slate. The idea is, of course, that we have no pre-existing biases for anything that we're going to do. But of course, the environment and the way that we sense the environment is going to be processed through this big biological organ we have in our brains, in our, in our heads, called our brain. And so I think that this environment-only model here is going to be completely nonsensical as well, unless you're going to talk about the fact, again, that we're perceiving the environment through the brain. The brain is made up of all these cells, which in turn have your genes. Your genes are going to make you a little bit different from everyone else. But also your unique experiences and your unique memories are going to make you different from everyone else. And so here's the final question. If my personality, my wishes, my emotions, everything about me comes from my brain, that's this little guy right here, is everything about my life determined? And I just want to finish this by saying, think of the children. Won't someone think of the children? This is horrible. Everything's determined. There is no free will. No, of course not. That's silly. I want this is actually showing is that we have predispositions. Genes don't determine. Environment doesn't determine. For all of those traits I showed you, for essentially anything that I can think about measuring, there are rules for genes and the environment. They interact in incredibly complicated ways to produce behavior. And again, there's no clear line in most of these things between where the normal range of behavior stops and where the abnormal state begins. And so with that, I'll say thank you.